Hello, everybody. Thank you for checking in on Entrepreneur Hour. Um, you know, yesterday I was supposed to have a politician on, and um, I really wanted to get his take on what was happening, but you know, there was a, there was a media blackout, a social media blackout, so I decided not to do the show. He's gonna come on tomorrow, though. Um, but yeah, man, I, you know, I'm in the Bronx and I'm in a bubble. I'm not, I'm not in the parts of the Bronx where it's really the looting and all that is going on. So, um, I'm lucky for that, but, um, I think, you know, what's going on across America, you know, is a boiling point. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a business person, you know, you see a lot of companies now making a stance about where they, where they, um, where they're putting their line, you know, like it's kind of like the Me Too moment of police brutality where you can't act like it doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, I've been really trying to figure out, I had a conversation yesterday about where's the line, right? I had a friend, we, we, were, we were talking about doing a lot of different things. And he was talking about, you know, where do you stop the line of talking about politics? And I was, I was like, well, I've never really had to worry that much about that um, because I'm, I'm my own boss. But at the same time, I do work with companies, brands, right? So I can't really say anything, but I can. So I'm in this weird boat. But I guess my, my answer to him was, right now, if I can't talk about this, who, who can, right? Like, there's not many people doing what I'm doing. I, I'm trying to be on every day talking about what's going on business-wise. And there's societal problems, right? And and they affect business. Look, we're, we're, they're looting stores and stuff like that. So like, it's a weird time. It's a weird time to like, to uh, be alive, period. Angel, what's up, man? Um, to be alive, period. Enrique, yeah, definitely, let's catch up. I want to have you on the show, actually. You got to come on my show. Um, so I think... You know we're in this weird, really weird time, but it's it's at the same time I'm I'm able to protest in a different way, right? I am protesting through the future, like through MetaBronx. We're working with, so I'm gonna we're gonna make an official announcement about this, but we're gonna work with a hundred kids this summer, and we're going to work having them in startups. So the kids are gonna get experience in startups. They're gonna be working in media technology. Um, software, uh, there's different teams, accounting, finance, they're going to be different teams. And each kid in our, in Metabronx is going to go through the different parts of a business to see what they enjoy doing and what they, what they're passionate about. And then they're going to be able to, at 13 years old, start to understand where they can make a difference. Right. So not only by starting their own companies, but like if the way I see it is I was one of these kids that I was not the best student. I, I wasn't bad, but I wasn't the best. I really didn't care. It took me figuring out with art what was a career path that really lit me up. And then I went to college and, and community college first because I didn't even apply to colleges, right? So if you look at these, this, these, this society scenarios where a lot of people are kept in a specific place and then they, they get angry and then they have to like, you know, uh, let that anger out. And when times like this, that's when this happens. I'm lucky. And I, I always know it. I'm lucky. I came from the Bronx. I was lucky enough to find that thing I was passionate about. I was lucky enough to get a stolen computer. My parents were, had the foresight to say, okay, we can't afford this, but if this guy's willing to give it to me for this price, we're going to take it and give it to our son. Right. So all these lucky breaks I had put me in a position to be able to talk about this. And if I can't talk from this perspective, I don't I don't even think it's worth doing. Right. So this this all comes back to like, you know, what do you what do you do politically in situations like this as an entrepreneur? To me, you know, I guess whatever side you're on, voice it. To me, I'm on the side of I, I support what's going on. I'm not supporting the rioting. I'm, I know people, there are people taking advantage of the situation and just breaking into places knowing, hey, I'm going to get away with it. Masks are, are a thing now, so their faces are not being shown. So I think 
it's messed up to to break people's businesses that have not really put you in these situations, right? So like on Fordham Road, Fordham Road is like Bronx is burning again. Those stores didn't oppress you, you know, like you're just taking advantage, right? So you want to go in there and steal. It might be because you're you're in a financial pinch though, right? And and that is society, but that store owner is not their fault, right? So the, like to me, to protest and 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 be going into people's stores that um can't that are not really oppressing you that's not that's not the move right so and then as as an entrepreneur that works on tech and has a nonprofit my thing is i want to empower the youth to look at technology and say this is my opportunity like i can start to change my scenario hold on my kids are are hold on one second one second <laughs> my kids homeschooling this is the new normal they're on zoom and i told them get this stuff together before i get on my show because i'm not gonna be able to get off and of course they did it so now they're asking me questions and i can't help them um responsible parenting huh uh but uh at the end of the day i just i just see this time as a as a super interesting time that that people need to talk about and i'm willing to talk about it i don't care i don't have sponsors i don't have you know, but then I did what I did tell my friend is as Meta Bronx grows, I do worry about something I say eliminating some of the support Meta Bronx is getting because we are starting to grow in our support. It took a while, but it took a while for us to get support from the local um, government and from local people. Uh, and now we're getting big sponsors so you can't really say something that you 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 know lose some sponsorship but at the same time they are funding metabronics because we are what we are we are saying look this is a problem this is how we think we need to solve it and if you agree give us some funding and they agree so if i say something that's out of that area uh, you know, I, I will have to pay the repercussions, but I don't think I will. We'll see. But um, so I the way I see it is, you know, we are in a in an interesting time, and I do believe we all all entrepreneurs right now. No, there's. I had a conversation yesterday. All right, I'm not gonna say who it was with, but if you know the situation, you will know. Maybe who I'm talking about. There's there's a big organization. I'm gonna to try to like hide it as much as possible. There's a big organization, one of the richest organizations in the world that is supporting Bronx initiatives. And I spoke to one of the representatives yesterday because they really like what we're doing with Meta Bronx. And he told me that this huge financial organization is planning to try to help sustain nonprofits for the next two years because they believe the next two years is what it's gonna take to bounce back from this. So if you are, I don't care what aspect of the life you're in, very few people have two years worth of their finances saved up, you know? So you're gonna have to figure out what happens if I lose my job? And you're gonna have to figure out other ways of making income. If you only have one income stream right now, very dangerous. That's very dangerous. I don't care what your job is. It's very dangerous. There's business owners that may never come back. I speak to uh, tech startups all the time, entrepreneurs all the time. There's people who are targeting the, the restaurant business that are worried that most of restaurants will not recover from this. Think about that. Like That's a lot of people that now have to figure out other ways of generating income. They have to be entrepreneurs. They have to think. What is my option? So today, you know, this is a definite, as a book episode. I try to do a book episode every five episodes where I work on my book. But today I'm going to be less about writing out the book and more about like what this, this situation is making me think about that may work its way into the book. So like right now, there's a lot of unrest about 
this police brutality brutality thing is one part of the systemic racism, right? So me, the reason I'm an entrepreneur is I really didn't see the career path I wanted. And I, I didn't like that I knew I was not going to get to the level I could get to just because I'm brown. I knew it. I was one of the, always one of the only brown people. I was, telling, I was telling a story yesterday, even as an entrepreneur, I'm going to tell you an interesting story. As an entrepreneur, I speak at conferences. I speak at things. I, I work with huge companies. A few years ago, I'm working with one of the largest brands in the world. I guess it it wasn't all right. So you know what I'm gonna tell you. I was going to a meeting with Chanel to to meet with Chanel because I was working on a cutting bleeding edge project for them. So I walk into the building and I had some of the equipment I was using, but I had I had I was dressed up. I wasn't like in a t-shirt. And I'm like I'm coming to see the person at Chanel. Uh, I gave the name. And they said, um, it was a Hispanic guy on the other side. He's like, what's your name? And I was like, Miguel Sanchez. He's like, can I see ID? So I was like, sure, that, that's pretty normal. We'll give the ID. And he said, what are you here to do? And already I'm like, do you ask everybody that comes into the building this? You know, and I was just like, I'm here to work with Chanel on a project and I'm going to present what we are working on. And he's like, all right, you have to go to the freight elevator. And I'm like, that don't sound right. Like, I'm a vendor that's working with this big company, probably one of the biggest companies in your building. And you're telling me that I have to go to the freight elevator because of what? He's like, well, you have equipment. And I'm like, it's a headset. It was a, it was a augmented reality headset. It was a HoloLens. I'm like, it's not like I got like 100 pounds of stuff. What are you talking about? You know, so I said, look, I'm just going to talk to the girl. So I, I, I text the girl who I was supposed to meet and she was furious. She was not a white person, but she was furious. She came down. She screamed at the guy. She's like, I, you never, you've never done this. I've never had a person ever, ever go through this. Um, so, hold on a um, so she said, I, I can't, I can't even get into it right now, but this is wrong. And then she brought me up and, and the whole time I'm like, I, I get that this Hispanic man was trying to save his job. He, he, he viewed me as a threat for some reason. Right. He he. So even as an entrepreneur, you can't get out of this systemic racist thing that exists. Right. And I get it. I get it. I get it from all sides. I understand it. But the only real way to change it is for them to see more people like me in that position and not see it as, wait, this don't look right. This guy. Not light skinned Hispanic. Definitely more of the brown Hispanic. You're doing what with Chanel? I don't believe you. You know, so, you know, at the end of the day, it makes me think about what's going on right now. And I, and part of what we're doing at Metabronx is to say, look, we want we want you kids to see that this is possible. I do it. There's all of our, a lot of our mentors are, are just like me. People that are not supposed to be in the spaces we are in, but we're in them. And we're doing well in them. So, you know, as as um, I think about this book and ideas, I don't want to angle it strictly towards minorities trying to make ideas or women trying to make ideas or LGBT or whatever is the oppressed right now person. But in a way, it is why I'm doing it. It's why I do Metabronx too, right? Metabronx exists because... Me and my partner, who you, you I gotta get him on the show one day. He's just so busy with Metabronx. Um, he is a white male. I am Hispanic male. We're both in media and technology. And when we met, we we're both same age, and we told each other our stories. And he was so shocked at the story that I had versus what he had, and he was like, 
I never even knew it was that bad. And and you probably have it good because you got to where you got. There's many people who never got there because of some of those hurdles you had to jump through. So we started just having like real raw discussions about what is going on. What is the racism? He's French. In France, there's racism. You know, in America, there's racism. He's fighting against it, you know, trying in any way he can because as a white male, you have to figure out what's the right way to do it. And even now, he still gets called racist by people just because he's white. And if he says one thing that they can just take that way, he gets. So we have these real conversations as a white man and a brown man. We have created Metabronx because we can have those conversations, those battles in a, in a room where it's like we both know where we're coming from. And it's, it's all being created. We're all talking about this. We're only talking about this to make the situation better. We're not talking about it to be like, yeah, F those people, right? So... You know, as I think about this book and what how it comes back to writing this book, I'm wondering if I should angle it more towards towards anything in, in specific. Like, should it be more about minorities making ideas? I don't know, you know, because niches, niches are good sometimes. So that's a thing to think about that I need to really start to, to think about where... Do I niche this book down? How to how to make your idea happen if you are a, not a white man? <laughs> Which that could be controversial enough to get me some book sales, right? Like, and it's true. It's what I work on. Like, very few people that come to me for help are white males because they don't really need the help. They they have a easier path. Uh, but it has happened. I'm not going to say it hasn't happened. It happened to me the other day. Uh, somebody reached out on Twitter. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I should only focus on those people or not. It's a good question that I'm going to have to really think to, through and talk to a lot of people about. But, um, if anybody watching this has any advice, any ideas that, of what they think I should do, yeah, definitely let me know. Should I make the book more angled towards people that have had a, a rougher time making that, their ideas happen, like brown people, black people, women, gay, whatever else is in that. Or should I just make it more general? If you have an idea, um, what to do? Good question. Uh, any advice? Uh, hey, hey, Gassan. Um, any advice or comments or just like this, it helps more people see it and maybe they'll give me advice. Um, so that is what I'm thinking about with all this protesting. Like what I'm, I'm doing, I'm not out there protesting. I got young kids. I can't really take the chance that I get a random bullet to the eye. Um, random. Um, I... The way I'm protesting is through technology and by empowering young people. And I've been doing it since way before these riots. Um, so maybe this book is a way of doing that, like by angling it more towards the people I actually work with and have been working with. It may bring me less sales, but it may make more impact to the people I care about making impact with anyway. Um, it's a thought, and the, the thought is, you know, valid, and I would love anybody's feedback that's watching. Um, Yuga-san, what you think? What, what should I make the book about? Should I make the book more about helping brown people, anybody who's been oppressed make their idea happen, or should I just talk about making an idea happen? Um, I don't know if you're still watching, but uh, so so that's that's one thing. Another thing uh, I had a good conversation yesterday about, and I started to figure out, because anybody, just so you understand, when people write a book, the book is basically a however many page sales pitch. It is. You know, at the end of the day, you're reading a book, they're talking to you about their ideas, and then eventually you want to work with that person. Tell you another super interesting story about Meta Bronx and a book. So I happen to, I'm not even sure how it came across, maybe through reading another book, they mentioned it. And when I say reading, I mean listening. I'm an audiobook guy. 
they mentioned this book called The Innovation Blind Spot. And it was talking about how people from communities that are traditionally left behind can create innovation. And the people investing right now are not investing in these communities. And that is a blind spot. There's money in those communities if they treated them the same way they would treat other communities. So I'm reading this book and I'm like, I could have wrote this book. This is exact. I've been saying this for years, like 10 years. So I read this book and I'm like, actually, it's not a bad thing that this person wrote the book. It was a white guy that wrote the book from venture capital. More credibility, right? I'm not a person that has raised, raised $50 million. So what am I talking about, right? I'm, I'm talking as an angry Hispanic man, but this guy as a white man who has raised millions of dollars and has a fund specifically targeting these people, he wrote the book. And the, the super interesting thing about the book is his grandfather created the basketball um, infrastructure. The basketball infrastructure is, let's say you're a great basketball player at the age of seven. The NBA knows who you are by that time. If you're seven years old and you're dominating in your league, people in the NBA already know who you are. But that's not the case when if you're a rock star programmer or great at, at, at have a great idea and you come from the hood, they don't have that formula. So this guy, his grandfather made the basketball equivalent to what he wants to make for technology. So I remember reading that and being like, I have to get in touch with this guy. I have no clue how I'm going to do it, but I have to. Not even a week later, this is the way the universe works. It's crazy. Not even a week later, one of our founders, Marlon, who was on the show a, week, a few weeks back, Marlon Jenkins, look it up. He had been going around and he's very community focused. Like that's another big thing about, we try to bring in founders and work with people that are community focused, meaning it's not just about you. It's about what you could bring to the community. Because if it's just, you just taking from the, from the community and not giving back, you're not building, you just take, you know? So Marlon is one of the best entrepreneurs we have at giving back. So he's always hitting me up and saying, look, I found this, maybe it could help Metabronx, right? So he found Village Capital, who is the company of the guy who wrote the book. They had a contest and they were looking for communities that were working, they were called ecosystems, working to create ecosystems, meaning they had all the parts that would help an idea succeed. So that's exactly what we've been doing at Metabronx. So he sends me, the email. He's like, look, these guys, you should check them out. And I'm like, holy shit. This is the same guy. I just read the book. So I send it to my partner because he's much better at paperwork and I'm not doing paperwork. I'm horrible at it. We apply. We won. We were the only, so, so there was uh six communities they chose around America. We were the only community they never heard of that applied and we won. Because we work with kids too. We're not just an accelerator program that just accelerates minority women, LGBT. We also bring kids from the community and give them internships. So that book was his sales pitch to me. If I didn't listen to it, I wouldn't even known about Village Capital. And then when Marlon would have sent me that, I wouldn't have been so interested. So when I create this book, I'm trying to reverse engineer that scenario. Like, okay, where's the Miguel that I want to read this book and then find me. And then, you know, so that's how I'm looking at it. I know not everybody's thinking like that, but I am because I understand a book is your calling card. A book is your hook. So I, I had, I had a, a, one time I met this woman that she coaches book writers and she, her, her thing was a book is your hook. It's your way to, uh, thanks, Hassan, um, a way to let people know what you do. And if they buy into you to the level where they read your book and they connect and they say, whoa, this person really is 
the type of person I want to work with, like I did with that guy. But I already knew he was out of here. He had a huge fund working everywhere in the world. Like they're working in Africa and all these like town places in America. I mean, in the world that are traditionally left behind by innovation. And I'm like, why is this guy going to answer my tweet or email? Right. I'm just this Bronx guy trying to do something that's impossible. Right. But they did. And it happened. And like, Within a month, we had a partnership with this company that I just read the book. It's just mind blowing to me how that how that happened, and it's just an amazing an amazing partnership. We love the fact that we're working with them. They love the fact that they're working with us. They help us a lot, um, and it's amazing. And and now it puts us in a position to help startups even more and kids even more. So it's all it's all and and I, I really attribute it to reading that book because once I read that book. I told every single founder, every single partner, yo, this book is exactly what we're talking about. And if you don't believe it from me, because that's what happens, right? You come from the hood, it's hard for people to believe you. If you're not a millionaire and have exited five companies, they're going to look at you like, why? Why should I believe you? But that guy saying the exact same thing I said to you five years ago, you'll listen to that guy. So that's where the book actually helped us too. Uh, so when they read, so a lot of people started reading it and being like, whoa, this is, this is, this is kind of crazy that this opportunity exists. And I'm like, yeah, I've been telling you this for like five years, but I'm glad that now you understand it. So now I see this police brutality stuff and I'm like, okay, this is our time. This is our time to really prove that we can make a difference in this way. Like I, I posted a video on my Instagram, if you follow me on Instagram, uh, where there's this two, two uh, uh, older guy is a 20, a 31 year old, a 16 year old and a 46 year old, something like that. And they're arguing about the looting. And the 46 year old is like, you know, I'm willing to die for this right now. We, we're fed up. We willing to die. And the 16 year old is like kind of heading towards the guy, the 46 year old and the, the 31 year old comes out and he's like, I, hey, hey, uh, charisma. Hey, um, the, the, the 31 year old tells the 16 year old, look, I was doing this 10 years ago. People before me, he was doing this 10 years before that. We keep doing this every few years. You guys have to figure out a different way. And that video was like, that's what I've been saying. I've been saying this, like the real way is not, look, they rather let us burn this country to the ground than, than arrest four people. This system is not going to change unless we have our come up and we can make them change it, right? So the way to have the come up, one is politically, you got to get the people that look like us in there that understand our situation. So people like I've had on the show already, Michael Blake, Julio Pavon, tomorrow I'm going to have Tomas Reyes, Tomas Reyes, Ami Ramos. I'm trying to get other politicians that are going right now for the Bronx. I'm trying to get them on the show. Um, we got to get those people representing us first. That's one easy, and that's easy. All you got to do is go and vote, and that happens. The next thing is harder, where we educate our young people, give them experience, give them opportunity, and let their brains come up with the next. Facebook, Twitter, that we own. And when I say we, I mean, we're going to have to invest in them. We're going to have to put up the money. We're not going to have, to, we're not going to be able to say, let the venture capitalists fund it. Let the venture capitalists give them a million dollars. Then they're going to own most of this idea. There's 1.4 million people in the Bronx. If we each gave this idea a dollar, we own this idea and that profits, those profits can be reinvested into the Bronx. That's what I think needs to happen. So the first step is, is putting young people in the environment so they can come up with the next Facebook. Zuckerberg made Facebook at 17 years old, 18 years old. So a lot of people, that's one of the arguments. Oh, but those are young kids. You think Zuckerberg wasn't knowing about COVID when he was 13? You don't think he, he interned at some place that, you know, it's, it's like they, we are thought of different and we got to think about how the people who have done it, Elon Musk, all these, these people, they didn't start their businesses at 30. 
they started at 16, 17, making random businesses in tech, in tech. Elon Musk, I'm not sure the full story. I, I was, I started to listen to his bio. He made something, I think, before he was 20 years old, like some tech, and sold it. Then he made PayPal. Then he made Tesla. Then he made SpaceX. He started out as a young person in this tech world. And we as minorities don't get that opportunity. We have to hopefully learn code and get some internship, hopefully. Right? And 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 me, I, I started when I started in technology, it was very different. It was very hard to get into these these companies. I had to, and that's the thing. I'm always hard on our entrepreneur, on our young people. I, I pretty much tell them, look, you have to be 10 times better than anybody else because that's the only way you're gonna get the job. And that was the only way I was able to get the job. It had to be so clear that I was better that it was a no-brainer. So I had to make sure in my mind I set myself up to, to motivate myself to be that much better. So now I try to do that with kids. I try to do it with my kids. Sometimes it's not good. P people don't like it. My brother, I try to do it with my brother. Uh, many of the mentors that I've had, you know. Um, but it comes out of the, the understanding of this. This, this systematic racism is not going to give you anything unless you can prove you're way, way better. So that's what entrepreneurship allows. There's nobody telling me what to do. I get to choose what I do. And if I'm better, I make money. If I'm not, I don't. That's the fairest thing you can get. Um, so bringing it back to the book, I think about, you know, maybe angling it a little bit more like Innovation Blind Spot does. Maybe I'll take a little bit of the Innovation Blind Spot angle. Also, it makes me think about what, how would I want somebody that that finds it to reach out to me and and um and work with me, right? After reading this book, what do I want? So my goal for a long time was I want to help make a million millionaires. That was my first idea. I said, you know what? I want to figure out if I can think the biggest. How can I make a million millionaires that look like me? I did that. Those communities. Hopefully you'll get better. But then I realized that's not really what happens. A lot of times millionaires become millionaires and lead their communities and they'll they'll give, they'll donate 10 grand here and there. And that doesn't really change the community if they do at all. So I said, all right, I just want to help a billion entrepreneurs because the way I see it is if I can help create a billion entrepreneurs or help them just with Anything. You watch one of my videos, I count that, right? If I can help a billion entrepreneurs in any way, you learn one thing from me, I'm good. Then what that'll do is it'll make it so people are less reliant on the current screwed up system for people like us, right? Because if you're an entrepreneur, you have your, you, you own your own destiny. You control your own destiny and, and, and you don't have to take any shit from anybody. If you don't like a client, you fire them. They're just not your client no more, you know, and that's fine. It's not going to put you out of business. Sometimes you're in a situation where that client does, if you lose that client, it does put you out of business, but then that's not good business. You need to have more than one client. You, If you have one client that they can walk away and it, it disappears, that's not, that's not a business. That's very bad. That's bad business. So, Basically, what I'm looking at is this content in general, right? This content is going to live forever on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch. Actually, I don't even know how Twitch works. I think it's just live streams. And I'm hoping over time more and more people see it. They learn one thing from it, and that, that puts me in my billion, help a billion entrepreneurs. And when I say entrepreneur, I don't mean you got to be Elon Musk. I just mean, even if you got a side hustle and you have a job, that's an entrepreneur. Like if you, if you watch this and set up a drop ship store for free, like the other video I showed you, you just became an entrepreneur and, and hopefully I helped you. Um, that's how I see it. So this book, my book's goal is just part of that. That's my why, right? My why is I want to figure out a way to innovate, to help a billion entrepreneurs. Everything I do is really focused on generating enough revenue to do that.
So the nonprofit, nonprofits, you know, that's my philanthropy. Um, I don't get money for that. I'm pretty much, you know, giving my time away right now for that. That could change eventually once more and more people support this organization. Maybe I could do more of that, which would probably probably be my best impact. But it doesn't pay bills because, like I said in another episode, you know, usually things that do good for people don't make a lot of money. So when I think about this book, I want to make sure I do help as many entrepreneurs. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about my background. Maybe that's the way I angle it. But I I. I got to really think about, do I want to make it super angled towards people that are excluded normally? So, and then when I, when you do want to work with me, how does that look? So I have multiple things right now, right? So if you want so if you read my book and you want to work with me and you want to help me with the kids situation and help kids, Metabronx, I could say, okay, come work with me at Metabronx, volunteer, donate. Which anybody watching this, you can donate to Meta Bronx right now. Um, those those are ways, right? If you want to hire me to build something for you, that's where I have mass ideation. You hire me and the team to build whatever you need, and that's what I do right now. And then there's gonna be a level of this where part of, part of what I'm doing here is creating a personal brand where I'm willing to work one on one with people for, of course, more money is more expensive. Because the time is the most valuable thing. So if I'm, it's kind of like many of these people do it. They have themselves and they have their teams. You can work within their teams. That's the cheapest way to work with them. But if you want to work one-on-one with them, it costs a lot more money. So that's the path I want to head down. You know, and, and anybody who's in this world, same path, right? You have your services, that that's where you make your money. One may, not everybody has a philanthrop- philanthropic arm. Um, but then they do have the um, personal coaching or uh, consulting, right? So right now, that's I'm figuring out the personal consulting, the mass ideation. But then I even have a new level that I'm really working on, which is, let's say you're not any of those things, but you are a willing future entrepreneur, but you don't know what to do. Sure, hopefully I'm going to have thousands of videos that you can watch, or you can go to this online class. I'm going to figure out how to make it as affordable, if not free as possible, where it will be a breakdown. Here's how you set set up a Shopify. Step step one through 10, literally tutorial, do it. Of course, you can find that on YouTube. You can find almost anything on YouTube. Some people just rather the structure and the hand-holding. And that's where I'm trying to figure out because I see this a lot. Like I take classes. I just took a YouTube class and it helped me with all this. And their system was pretty cool. They had few people working. There was the main guy who brought me in. I watched his video. I've been watching it for years. He finally got me. He said, hey, right now I'm doing a free challenge. I came into the challenge. I said, you know what? Right now I'm trying to build my YouTube before I wasn't. But I still followed him for two years because I was thinking about it. He brought me into his system and his team helped me. He didn't help me. His team helped me. If I wanted to talk to him one-on-one, it was going to cost me thousands of dollars. I wasn't willing to do that. I'm sure some people are, though. So that's kind of what all this entrepreneurship stuff is, right? Like, at the end of the day, the more from personal brand you are, the better your businesses do, the better you do. So that's why I do this show. That's why I want to do the book. That's why I do the speaking engagements. Because it just makes business a lot easier. It just does. So part of me is always trying to convince entrepreneurs to do stuff like this, because I'm telling you, literally the story I started out with, the Chanel story, I got that because I spoke at a conference. It wasn't even a conference. I'm going to be, it wasn't even a conference. It was a meetup for free. They invited me to speak at a meetup about technology. I go, I do my thing, I'm walking off, everybody comes to you to to talk to you, shake your hands, hey, great talk, thank you, Um, I really would like to understand more about what you do, let's schedule some time to get coffee, girl comes up, hey, I'm head of the watch division of Chanel, I want to do what you just showed me on that screen, 
can you help me sell this to my boss? Sure. Think about the opposite way that that would have had to happen. What would have had to happen for me to have that opportunity with Chanel? I have to call Chanel every day, call every person hoping that they are going to pick up the phone for some random person, have a meeting. So much harder to make situations like that happen if you're not doing this. Like close to impossible, really. So when I think about all of this, I think this content, even what I create right now, this show, this show, today I wasn't going to do this show. I was like, uh, I'm, I'm like... Like, like my brain is kind of like still rap, uh, going crazy about all the stuff going on in society. My sons are about to be on a call at the same time and they need my help. I'm like, you know what? I'm just take today off. Then I was like, you know what? I promised myself I'm going to do an hour a week of this book. And no, if I don't do this right now, I'm not going to do it. So let me just do it. And I'm glad I did again. Uh, people, people watched, people answered, people, people interacted. So it was worth it. And this video is going to live forever. Somebody's going to watch this and it's going to motivate them. It's going to give them an idea, whatever. So, and I may get a speaking gig. Right now, people are getting speaking gigs, making money from their house, speaking at conferences. I spoke at a conference a few weeks ago and I want to do more. It's another opportunity for revenue. Um... But the point of this hour is for me to figure out this book a little bit more. So for the 20 minutes left, I'm going to start talking about what I think from this week I got that helps me with this book. One thing is the coaching or consulting, the one-on-one -on -one consulting and coaching. Um, what, I, what I've come up with right now is I help people. Wait, all right, I'm going to start off. Start off. Um, there's a saying that says, you can't see the label of your own bottle from the inside. So with me, what I do is I help people see their own label, right? I help them clarify their idea, plan their idea, and do their idea. That's what I'm going to coach people one-on-one -on -one for. So that's come through weeks of thinking, weeks of talking to people, and I don't even know if it's final. But right now, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm saying. You're going to read this book, and this book is going to teach you how to clarify, plan, do, but most people, most people, including me, I talk to people because of the same reason. It's hard for me to see my own label. I need to, to, to talk to other people and, and hear what they see. And then they give me insights that help me to craft that label better. And then let me see it. And I'm like, all right, that's what I wanted. That's what I thought I was projecting. But I wasn't until you told me, I don't see that. This is what you need to do. So I see that. So that's what I'm, that's basically what the book the goal of the book is for people to hire me to help them see their own label. But I'm going to give them as much as possible so they can do as much of the work for themselves as possible. And maybe they can find someone close to them that can help them read the label, their own label. Right? So that's that's where I am with this whole, this whole thing. Down to my YouTube channel, right? Like, when you create a YouTube channel, people have to instantly understand what they're subscribing to when they get there. So right now, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. And if you go today, it's one version that I don't know if it will be the final version, but it's one step closer than not having thing, anything at all. So that's another thing, you know, you got to really fight perfection. Like, I could just not keep anything up there till I know perfectly what I'm going to do. But I don't care. I'm just, I got to have something up. It's better to have something than nothing. Even this show. Most people wouldn't do this show. I'm in a room in my house. My kids are freaking screaming, you know, school down the hall. I got music around me. I got not great lighting, my computer. You know, I can have a better uh, situation, whatever. 
but I'm doing it. I'm 35 episodes in, I think, 40 episodes in. Um, and I look at it and I say, why, why wait? Right. So like right now, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, everything exists. I'm not doing it right yet. I'm just figuring it out. And I don't mind figuring out on the fly. That's another thing about entrepreneurship. You kind of get to this zone where you don't care. Like, like the end of the day, you know things happen, good, bad. It's just about having an idea, testing it. it either works or it doesn't. Just because one idea doesn't work doesn't make you a failure. Just didn't work. All right, next, next, next. So for me right now, I'm doing this, you know, people like it. Some people don't, don't matter. I'm learning this, this today. I just created content that I learned from. I connected with people that watched. If you watch this 10 years from now, it's still valuable. My kids, maybe when they're, when they're my age, they want to do a business and I'm hopefully not, but I'm not around anymore. They can watch this, right? So to me, I just think entrepreneurship, one of the big things that you can learn and you can um, use, and it's definitely going to be in the book, is failing is part of the process. And if you are not willing to fail, you're not going to do anything in life because everything you're going to fail. Everything. There's nothing you're just going to do and you're going to get it fucking perfect the first time and you're you're rich, right? So you got to be willing to take those lumps. And I'm, I'm taking the lumps, right? I've taken lumps for years. And now I'm trying to make a book that helps you take less bumps, right? So when I think about all the scenarios that have happened to me, I'm going to try to make sure in this book, I address them and I give you what I wish I would have known when I made that decision, right? So I spoke about in another, in the episode from last Friday, contracts, right? I think right now, knowing what I know, I still would have made that decision. I didn't get sued, so and you gotta watch that episode to really get in what's if I got sued, maybe that decision would be a totally different. I would I would think totally different about that decision. But you gotta take gambles, right? And I was willing to take that gamble. Um, and you know, if you don't understand that, you gotta watch the other show last Friday. So last 10 minutes. Um I guess what I'm thinking about right now when it comes to the book is I got clarify. I think I need to bulk up clarify, meaning how can you self-clarify your idea so it makes sense to you and anybody you speak to? Then plan. I think I have a lot of plan. Plan is all over the place. Uh, plan is how do you figure out what you're doing, how much it's going to cost you to do, who you need to do it with, how do you get those people? Then do is how do you put systems in place to make it happen, manage people, manage expectations, manage investors, manage customers. And then what is the end goal, right? Because a big thing of, of, of entrepreneurship is the exit strategy, right? Do you want to do this job? Do you want to do this to the end? So you die or do you want to sell this or do you want to make it a cooperative where you, you pass it on to the next generation of your community? Those are exit strategies. So, so do will have exit strategy in it. The big thing though is exit strategy should be part of your plan. So it might need to be in plan and do. So that's, that's the thing. Maybe I have like areas that I, Ooh, this is good. Maybe I have areas that I take and I have like areas of the business and I take you through those areas in the clarify stage, in the plan stage and in the do stage. That's good. That was worth it. That was worth the entrepreneur hour right there. All right. So I will take you through. Strategy, creative, technology, management, legal, and financial. 
of each stage, the clarify stage, the plan stage, and the do stage. I like that. I like that. And I think, I think that's a good place to end it, um, mostly because my kids are going crazy over there and I got to see what's going on. Uh, but there's a time capsule too, right? Like we are in this pandemic. We're home. Kids are home. I want to remember this too. Um, and I want them to watch this and remember, hey, remember when dad used to do a show in the room and you wouldn't be quiet? Um, so I think I'm going to end it there. And I'll, I, I thank you for anyone who watched and gave me comments and liked it. I truly appreciate that. Um, that's what helps this be seen by more and more people. And another thing I learned is to ask people to do something. So what I would ask you to do today is donate one dollar to MetaBronx on Facebook. So we have it on the website, which we're working. If you're interested in helping young kids and technology startups, if you donate one dollar to MetaBronx, it helps us do that more. Thank you. Thank you for your watching. Thank you for your time. Hopefully I helped you. And I hope you continue to help you. Thank you.